Finally, would you please welcome Richard Wilkins. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I think this, uh, what you were describing about the blogosphere, it's a bit like road rage. You get a completely different kind of behavior coming out in those things from elsewhere. And actually, Kate and I have given over 400 talks since our book came out. And uh, I'm often the audiences are self-selected as here, but sometimes we're talking to groups of people who are not self-selected, who wouldn't expect to agree with us, like very senior business people or um, people in the civil service or whatever. And the, the reception is so uniformly positive that I started to feel the world is full of what I call closet egalitarians. <laughs> uh, and the main policy um, uh, thing we need to think about is how to get ourselves out of the closet so that we're openly egalitarian and pushing that. Um, I feel it's odd actually coming here from <coughs> England it's, and I, at home I feel worried at how often uh, American policy experts are brought in to talk about uh, um, what we should be doing and they're the only country that do, does worse than we do and I think <laughs> it's, uh, uh, actually it should be Scots who come and tell us what to do in England rather than the other way around. Anyway, I'm really going to take you through um, the sort of picture we build up in, in our book, The Spirit Level, with a, um, a little more stuff on the environment than uh, usual. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to show you a lot of graphs, and I'm sorry that at the back, I'm sure this one looks like smoke from a factory <laughs> chimney or that Icelandic volcano. The ash actually is na the, the names of countries. You can probably tell that it's life expectancy against national income per person. And I show it for several reasons. One is because you can see in the early stages of economic growth, life expectancy improves very rapidly. And then it levels out. Uh, and that's important because you get rather the same shape if you look at happiness uh, or measures of well-being. Uh, and it's not simply a, a sort of seeming effect, because actually life expectancy is going on improving as fast as uh, it has done throughout, well, any decade in the last uh, 100 years or so. Uh, nobody knows why it goes on improving, but uh, that improvement is no longer related to economic growth at all. Uh, basically, even if we're stuck, say, on $30,000 per capita national income, uh, we still go on getting those... Uh, improvements in life expectancy that nobody understands. Uh, but the fact that you get that very similar curve, if you like, diminishing returns to economic growth, whether you look at uh, life expectancy or happiness or measures of well-being, I think means that we are the first generation to have got to the end of, of, what, of, of the real social benefits of economic growth. And, you know, it is what's transformed the quality of human life over the last one or two hundred years. But that's not going to go, go on forever. And actually, we've already got to the end of that. That's a really important point to bear in mind as we become aware of the environmental limitations to, to further growth. Um, but the other reason why I show you it is because I'm going to be talking entirely about these countries up here. Um, and they, amongst those, it really doesn't make any difference to life expectancy to have, uh, to be a bit richer or poorer. Actually, some of these countries are twice as rich as, uh, as uh, some of the other rich countries um, there. And it just doesn't make any difference. But remember, for poorer countries where people haven't got basic necessities, it's really important to have more. <coughs> but for us to have more and more of everything makes less and less difference. And I want to point out that I'm talking just about these countries on that flat part of the curve, because when I talk about inequality, people slip back into thinking that I'm talking about absolute standards of living and, and your material circumstances uh, in themselves rather than in terms of relativities, the differences between us. 
what, in a way, what I have to say adds up to saying that the primary relationship now is not between people and things, but between people and people. Uh, that it, it's a, that our well-being is is now socially determined you know, um, more fundamentally than perhaps before. If you just take the, that little bit of the graph and blow it up a bit bigger, if uh, this works, yes, it does. Uh, <coughs> same graph, just that the rich countries. You see, there's absolutely no suggestion of a relationship, but we know that. Health is always worst in the most deprived areas of our societies. And yet it doesn't help if we all get richer. You know, there's social gradients in health like this right across the society. I'm sorry this is not Scottish data. These are small electoral, <coughs> electoral wards of England and Wales, going from the most deprived on the right to the lowest life expectancy to the least deprived, the richest on the left with the highest life expectancy. It's not a difference between the poor and the rest of society. Everyone in this room is part of that. If you're not quite at the top, your health is less good than the people at the top. You know, we're all part of health inequalities. <coughs> but um, it's a real paradox that income or living standards or something matters very much within societies, but it doesn't matter between our, our rich, developed market democracies. You know, some of those were are twice as rich as others. And currencies have inverted to take account of prices, so people in Norway and the USA on the right can buy twice as much as people in Israel, Greece, and Portugal. This is really not about material standards. It's not about bricks and mortar anymore. It's about the differences between us. It's about social status, relativities, um, where you are in relation to others. So don't confuse while I talk. Uh, don't try and explain the inequality effects in terms of absolute material standards. It's about social relationships. I'm going to talk a lot about um, inequality, um, but I'm never uh, and equality. I'm never talking about any utopian state or a hypothetical society that doesn't exist. I'm simply talking about these rich market democracies on the flat part of that curve. And the measure we've used, simply because you can get it from the World Bank and the UN and so on, uh, and people understand it, is how much richer the top 20% and the bottom 20% in each country. And you see in the more equal countries on the left, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, in each of those countries, the top 20% is three and a half or four times as rich as the bottom 20%. That's the size of the gap. But on the right, Australia, UK, Portugal, USA, the gap's twice as big. Huge difference. You know, I think we tend to think of these societies as much of much of a muchness. You know, they are all rich market democracies. And yet, that's a really important difference. And basically what I'm going to do is to, to show you um, the difference it makes to our, all our lives. I think there is a tendency to be worried about the, if you like, the contrast between the material success of our societies and their many social failings. Um, our book is sometimes called a, a theory of everything. It's not. It's a theory of problems with social gradients. Not all these ones that the media preoccupied with all the time have social gradients, whether it's the chances of being in prison in that middle, top middle, three tier bunk, or teenage birth rates, or um, anti-social behavior or drugs or whatever it is. All these problems have social gradients. And I think people look at problems with social gradients and they think, well, you know, the vulnerable, the hopeless, they always end up at the bottom, and that's why the social gradients. <clears throat> I'm going to show you that these problems are anything from twice as common to ten times as common in more unequal societies. And however much you sort people, the vulnerable down and the resilient up, does not make more of the problem in the whole society? Uh, that view is, is uh, inadequate in terms of explaining the, uh, the effects of uh, differing degrees of inequality on these problems. Nor is it, nor are they produced at more at the bottom of society by the bricks and mortar themselves. 
that are produced by uh, as part of the effects of low social status itself. Um, we collected data on as many of these problems with social gradients as we could get reliable, internationally comparable data for. Um, we collected data on life expectancy, maths and literacy scores in kids in each country, infant mortality rates, homicide rates, imprisonment, teenage birth rates, uh, levels of trust, that's how much people feel they can trust others in society, obesity, mental illness, which uh, included uh, in uh, WHO figures and apparently it's standard to include drug and alcohol addiction as mental illness, and social mobility. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> we put them all together in one index, health and social problems. It's just a rag bag, they're all weighted equally. For those of you who know some statistics, um, the country's position is just its average Z score. Um, but uh, there you see the incidence of all those problems related to the measure of income inequality I've just shown you. It's an extraordinarily close relationship. I mean, it doesn't look like something out of the social sciences. It looks like physics with a little bit of measurement error. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> put that same measure of uh, health and social problems in relation to national income per person, and there's no relationship. You might think there's a sort of downward drift, but that's only because of Portugal up there. If you forget Portugal and remember the USA, you'll see why the statistics say there's no relationship. So these problems strongly related to inequality, but not to GNP per capita, uh, just like the life expectancy I started out by showing you. We were worried as inequality is such a politically sensitive thing that um, people would think we'd chosen these to suit our argument. In fact, you can see that you know most of the things you might expect, problems with social gradients that you might expect to find internationally comparable data for, we've got in there. But um, <clears throat> we also thought we should look at the UNICEF index of child well-being. And if you like, this is adult well-being and the other was child well-being. But the advantage for us of the um, UNICEF index of child well-being is that we had no hand in selecting its components. There are 40 components. Every aspect of child well-being goes into it. So, you know, child immunization rates, whether kids have books at home, whether they can talk to their parents, um, whether there's bullying at school, how they do in these maths and literacy tests, all that goes in. One of the measures, actually, is the proportion of children in each country in relative poverty. But as that's so obviously related to inequality, we took that out, because we didn't want people saying this is a circular argument. And the picture is very, very similar. Strong relationship, and it's a very highly significant relationship between inequality, again that same measure, and um, uh, child well-being. And when you look at it in relation to uh, national income per person, no suggestion of a relationship. All this is telling you exactly the same story each time. And it's it's such, so fundamentally important, so, so, you know, in terms of where we're going. Indeed, I, you know, that, that graph I first showed you with the great curve of countries like, like that, in a way, I think, you know, that rising part of the curve, early stages of development, you know, we should be pursuing material gain as fast as we can. But we have to alter course. Something fundamental has changed in the relationship between material standards and well-being, or increasing material standards of well-being, and our societies still haven't adapted to that. It's a very fundamental change we have to make there. And actually, it relates to hierarchy as well, because if you think of hierarchy amongst animals, ranking systems, and so on, it's about access to scarce resources. And so it means something very different where the resources are necessarily scarce from where they aren't necessarily scarce. Anyway, I want to show you some of the separate components of our index, um, partly to show you how big the differences in performance between more and less equal countries is, but 
Um, also to give you a feel for the data, this is um, a measure of trust from the World Value Survey. It's simply the percentage of the population who agree that most people can be trusted. Uh, I don't know what you, how you would ask, answer that very general question about trust, but you see in, um, in the more unequal countries, it's only about 15% of the population who feel they can trust others, but it rises to 60 or 65% amongst the more equal. Um, I, I may say we've done all this work twice. We did it on these rich developed countries and then repeated it among, on the 50 American states. Because although these relationships are highly significant statistically and so we can say it's not chance, we knew people would say it was chance. Um, uh, just national culture or something like that. So we repeated it all in the, on the 50 American states, asking just the same question. Do the more equal states, the states with small income differences, do they do better on all these kinds of measures? The picture is very, very similar. Almost everything that is significantly related to inequality internationally is significantly related amongst the American uh, states. Uh, and to give you an indication, this is uh, almost exactly the same measure of trust from the general social survey in the states. Um, and. Uh, it, it covers a very similar span. It doesn't drop quite as low, but you can see what a similar picture it is. This is mental illness. Um, <clears throat> it's the percent of the population with any mental illness in the preceding year. This isn't uh, people going into their GP or getting hospital treatment for depression or anxiety. It's WHO putting together data to allow us to make accurate comparisons of and levels of mental illness in different countries. And uh, what they did was uh, <coughs> use the same um, well-established diagnostic interviews on random samples of the population in each country. Um, and uh, you'll see there are just huge differences again around the, the countries that do better here, I suppose it's about 8% of the population that have some mental illness in the preceding year, and it rises to three times that level. Three times as much mental illness in Poles populations. Uh, it's just extraordinary. I may say that when we first um, published this graph in a, in a journal, uh, there were fewer data points uh, fewer countries that had data uh, had these um, uh, measures uh, put together. And, um, but since then, a few more have come in, and they fit very much on the, the line where um, we predict uh, on the assumption of a relationship with inequality. And in a number of contexts, uh, this view of the relationship between these problems and inequality turns out to have predictive value, which you know, is a real test of a, of a good theory. Um, this one is infant mortality. Uh, I may say we, the, the, you can see the regression line should be a bit steeper. It's being pulled down by Singapore here. Uh, I didn't believe that Singapore had the lowest infant mortality rates in the world. Um, uh, but we have an absolute rule that uh, if our source gives data um, for the countries in our data set, we include them um, because we didn't want to be um, accused of cherry picking or picking and choosing. Uh, but of course, that's exactly what we have been um, accused of. <laughs> um, uh, although, you know, you'd have thought that a graph like that in the book could show people we weren't cherry picking the data. <laughs> Silly. Um, this is drug abuse. Uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime has figures on uh, use of opiates, cocaine, cannabis, ecstasy, and amphetamines. Um, when we put them all together in one index, when we uh, have indexes, um, because the units are standard deviation units, we don't show numbers up the side because we were trying to write something popular. Um, and uh, you know, standard deviation units are not everyone's cup of tea. But clearly, uh, 
a, a, a highly significant relationship. Teenage birth rates, I want to hurry through these. Huge differences. These are births per thousand teenage women. And it goes from, well, five teenage births per thousand would be there. In the UK, we've got six times as many. In the USA, ten times as many. Absolutely vast differences. This is homicide rates. These are American states. Um, uh, with Canadian provinces, I probably from the front you can tell the, some little triangles down here. Are the Canadian provinces more equal and lower homicide rates? Um, but just look at the scale of um, the differences. It's 15 homicides per million would be there, and it goes up to 150. The graph in our book isn't so striking, um, uh, partly because we don't include the Canadian provinces. Uh, again, our critics from the taxpayers' allowance or whatever, say allowance rather than allowance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, yes, they, they take our graph on homicide and uh, say if you take off one or two countries, uh, there's not much you know, significance or something. We weren't the slightest bit concerned with that because there are 50 um, academic papers showing this relationship. It's a robust relationship, the tendency for violence to be more common in more unequal societies. In a way, our book is important not for the evidence it contains, uh, but for getting the evidence from a picture that's been building up in the academic literature that nobody reads, and saying, look, it's as simple as this. Uh, and what we've done is just take the same group of countries, the same um, uh, measures of inequality, whatever the problem, and show it just recurs again and again. Uh, and our critics' main strategy is to pretend that ours is the, we are the only people who've ever suggested that inequality matters, a uh, completely absurd idea, and all our evidence is manufactured. Um, there are 200 papers looking at inequality, uh, income inequality, and health outcomes in endless different contexts. And yet, you know, they say take off these countries or add in a few of those countries and the relationship in our book is no longer significant. I just want to say, look, here's a paper on, on the provinces of China that shows that the more unequal ones have worse health. Which ones do you want to take off to get rid of the relationship? <laughs> or or this, these half dozen ones that look at rich and poor countries together? Which ones are you going to take off uh, to get rid of the relationship? I mean, it's nonsense. Um, uh, sorry, I seem to be going on rather about the criticisms. <laughs> <laughs> there was a conversation earlier about them, and I, I suppose the introduction uh, made me unusually aware of them. But a really interesting distinction between the academic um, arguments. The academic arguments are about how to interpret these relationships, what's going on behind them. Almost no academics deny that relationships exist, whereas the political criticisms uh, have uh, all um, suggested that uh, the relationships don't exist. Uh, prison populations, uh, probably, this is a log scale up the side, but probably a tenfold difference. 40 would be somewhere there, going up to 400. So, ten times the proportion of the population imprisoned in some countries compared to others. Uh, uh, Kate Black always likes to say when she's giving this that uh, the Greek figure, uh, I don't know actually whether it, these figures are before or after two of them escaped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was in the papers because they obviously had a friend with a helicopter who landed in the prison yard and they flew away. And it was a good story because it was the second time they'd done it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a very reliable friend. <laughs> um, but the serious thing about this graph is it's not driven primarily by more crime. You know, in the UK, our prison population has reached their maximum, while uh, crime rates have been declining for some years. Um, and in the US, we find, find several research papers which talked about the 
um, tried to explain the rise in US uh, prison populations, and they said that only about 25% of it there was due to more crime. Most of it is more punitive sentencing. And I think that, you know, just, I showed you the effect of the relationship between trust and inequality. I could have shown you measures of social capital and inequality, social cohesion, involvement in community life. Um, they're all closely related to inequality. And indeed, I think that basically what the data shows is that the intuition that many people have had since before the Industrial Revolution, well, before the French Revolution, actually, that uh, um, the, that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive uh, is true. That's what the data is telling us. But you see, this is another part of that same picture of the way in which inequality seems to be damaging to the quality of social relations. Um, and it, in the U US, we also see not only harsher sentencing, but the prisons are, are harsher, the more unequal end. Um, I often say, if you've got to go to prison somewhere, you should go to prison in the uh, more equal countries, you'll get some remedial help. Whereas if you go in the more unequal countries, you'll probably come out brutalized. Uh, there's also a tendency for more unequal states to, uh, they're more likely to retain the death penalty than the more equal ones. Um, this is social mobility. It's another graph actually where more data has come in since we first published it. Uh, this is income mobility. It's basically asking do rich fathers and have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons. Uh, Women don't exist in this graph. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose you can see why they did it this way. Uh, none of the data, um, none of the data is um, collected by us. Um, but uh, you see, in the more equal countries, there is higher social mobility. Uh, father's income is less predictive of son's income. There is a weaker correlation between the two than in the more unequal countries. And uh, we like to say, if the Americans want to live the American dream, they should go to Denmark or Finland. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, the idea of equal opportunity is always the, the sort of idea that inequality is fair. You know, it's just a, a daft idea. and. Um, also, equality of opportunity is certainly unobtainable while well, you've got very big inequalities of outcome. Uh, you know, I think not only do rich parents always find ways of passing on their conscious and their unconscious uh, ways of passing on their advantages to their children, but I think also downward prejudices increase the greater status differentiation. You know, I bet there's more classism and racism. We have some evidence of these things, actually, and more discrimination against women in more unequal uh, societies. Um, and uh, so whether you think of it as the social ladder being steeper in more unequal society and it's harder to get up or the run is further apart. Um, this is actually a point that was made uh, strongly by John Hills in his National Equality Panel report. Um, I should say a little bit about um, uh, this business that almost everyone benefits from greater equality. I've been pointing out the scale of the differences in performance uh, because that alone is, is enough to make you think, perhaps, if you did some back of the envelope calculations, that this can't be driven by the poorest 10% of the population. The differences are too big for that, I, mean, I won't spend time uh, giving you an illustration, but fortunately we don't have to infer uh, that a larger proportion of the population is affected by inequality just from that kind of consideration, because sometimes you can, can make comparisons between more and less equal countries right across the social hierarchy. This is old data when people first wanted to compare health inequalities internationally. And some Swedish researchers classified lots of their infant deaths according to the old British uh, Registrar General's occupational class classification. 
Um, and it goes from social class one at the top, the professional occupations, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, directors of larger companies, down through five is unskilled manual, and then again anachronistically a classification by father's occupation, so single parents are together. But you see, Sweden does better than England and Wales right across the hierarchy. Um, even at the top they do better. And there's another paper on adult mortality showing just the same pattern. Um, we, th we show five or six graphs of that kind, different <coughs> comparisons between uh, where you can look across the social hierarchy in more and less equal uh, states or countries. And I think as close as you can get to a, a, a valid generalization is that inequality makes most difference at the bottom of society. The difference is the biggest at the bottom, but even at the top it seems to confer some benefit. Just one other example of that. This isn't actually in our book, but it's literacy scores in Sweden, Canada, and the US. Uh, the young adults, 16 to 25 years old, but here it's still being classified along the bottom by um, social class, they're classified by how many years of education their parents have had. So at this end, you've got the kids of better educated parents, presumably nearer the top of society. And you see even there, more equal Sweden does a bit better than less equal Canada or very unequal US. But again, at the bottom of society, children of less well-educated parents, really vast differences open up. And it's basically the same picture, but bigger differences at the bottom than the top. Uh, I, with, with the half dozen or so graphs that we show in our book illustrating <coughs> these in different contexts, uh, um, there are also uh, quite a lot of multi-level models in the literature, um, particularly looking at health, um, uh, where people control for individual incomes right across the society or individual education right across the society uh, and show there's an additional contextual effect. But colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, in one paper they talk about inequality as a general social pollutant because its effects weren't limited to the bottom but went right across the income scale. And we can't ever talk about the, the really rich because they're a fraction of 1% of the population and, you know, we never have the data on them. Uh, what comes next? So yes, just back briefly to this. To point out that it's always the same countries do badly, you know, not only the graphs I've shown you, but many more in the book. Uh, USA is nearly always the worst. Uh, it's a, I was, had some fears about giving this lecture in the States, but actually um, only people who like this sort of stuff came. <laughs> all right. But um, and it's always the same countries that do well. So what we're looking at is a sort of general social dysfunction related to inequality. It's not just one or two things that go wrong, it's most things that go wrong. And indeed, if you're going to have any alternative explanation, uh, not about inequality, then you have to think of a driver which is not only going to be related to inequality, but is also <coughs> going to explain why these problems tend to move together. Why teenage birth rates and homicide rates and health and uh, whatever it is, obesity, tend to be worse in the same societies. The funny thing is actually that you know, not only do people have that intuition that inequality is divisive and corrosive, but actually most people know a lot of this data. And before I started, I could have said, which countries in the developed world have more obesity than we do? And you all know the United States, and if I said the same thing about violence, uh, you'd know the answer to that too. And if I said prison populations, some of you might know the answer to that. And if I said life expectancy, again, and if I said, well, they better, we will say Scandinavian countries. So all that's, all that's new is pointing out how systematically this is related to inequality. And indeed, you know, there isn't a big causal jump because what they're saying is the problems we know are related to social status are worse if you make the social status differences bigger. Uh, it's as simple as that. 
before I leave this, though, um, I mean, people sometimes say it's cultural differences, but do remember, you know, people have looked at rich and poor countries together, or the countries of South America, or the provinces of mm -hmm. the regions of Russia, and so on. Uh, but actually, you can take off the English-speaking countries, and there's still a significant relationship left, um, even though we have so few data points. Um, <coughs> Um, um, yes, I wanted to say something about Sweden and Japan. Extraordinary different cultures, uh, opposite ends of the poles in terms of position of women, the nuclear family and so on, uh, amongst OECD countries, um, women's economic participation rates or their representation in politics, totally different. How they get their greater equality is totally different. Sweden has very big earnings differences and it redistributes through taxes and benefit to become more equal. Japan starts off with small earnings differences, does less redistribution, has a smaller welfare state, and yet they both do equally well. So, and, and we see very similar contrast amongst the American states. One of the states that does uh, pretty well is uh, New Hampshire. It has lower state taxation and lower social expenditure than any state except Alaska and yet they start off with small income differences. I, I'm not sure why, but one of the things I've learned recently is that uh, they protect trade union rights. Uh, you are not allowed to try and get employees to sign a contract banning trade union membership, and it's illegal to organize strike breaking. Uh, we've come across a few papers that uh, make the point that strong trade union movements are uh, a fairly consistent part of more equal societies. Um, I, I'm taking too long. I think I'd better skip some of this. Um, uh, you can read it in the book, but basically it's about sensitivity to how you're seen. Uh, um, because I want to deal with some of the environmental stuff, uh, as this um, evening is, is meant to combine the two. Um, here, instead of having, it's like the, very like the first graph, and the, but instead of GNP per capita along the bottom, we've got CO2 emissions uh, against life expectancy. I think this is an important graph because uh, you see that countries start to gain high, low, high life expectancy at much lower levels of CO2 emissions than we have. The UK is there, um, uh, the USA out there. Um, and you've got France, Portugal, I think that's Sweden, uh, Costa Rica, I suspect. Um, well, uh, this is our world average CO2 emissions, and of course, even this is a reflection of existing technology. But it looks as if one actually, uh, if it ought to be possible, even on existing technology, for countries to move. All, all the world's countries move into that area, so we all have <coughs> high life expectancy, even with existing technology, um, for, uh, within the current um, CO2 emission levels, which of course are far too high, and we um, expect uh, um, policies and better technology and so on to reduce that. But more equal countries are better placed to deal with these problems. Um, Right. One of the things that's the real threat, I suppose, to environmental, um, uh, to sustainability, is consumerism. Uh, and that not only means that we consume so much more than we need, need but it means that uh, uh, governments are really afraid to do anything uh, uh, to reduce carbon emissions in terms of uh, whether it's green taxes or whatever else. Uh, and of course that consumerism is driven substantially by status competition, uh, which is increased, intensified by more in in inequality. Um, people in more unequal countries save less of their income, they get into debt more, they go bankrupt more, um, uh, and they work much longer hours. Because money is even more important, it says what you're worth whether you're a, a failure or a success and how other people see you. 
And if I had not jumped over that middle bit, uh, I would have talked about that, how that is uh, the important driver. Incidentally, they, the people in the more unequal countries uh, work about two months longer a year. Um, uh, an American was telling me that they mark a date in October by which uh, they have done uh, the annual hours work that Europeans do. Um, I think as well that more equal countries are more public spirited great and more aware of the common good. And because uh, community life is stronger, there's more trust, um, in a way you're less out for yourself. Um, uh, people are more aware of the common good. There are a number of indica indications of that. We made a sort of formal test of that, so uh, we, the first thing we looked at was um, uh, the percentage of um, national income that goes in foreign aid and the more equal countries are more generous aid donors. Um, we also looked at recycling. This is uh, recycling of, uh, I think, five different waste materials. And again, the more equal countries do uh, consistently better. Remember that when there are not data points for, for many of the countries that we look at where data is available, that's not because we don't like the data because it's not there. <laughs> uh, we also were shown this, um, attention was directed towards this data, which comes from a, an international survey of business leaders' opinions. And one of the questions they were asked was, how important do you think it is that your government abide by international environmental agreements? And in the more, uh, equal countries, they rate that as consistently more important. And of course, in the more unequal countries, you act for yourself. You have to be. Um, and that's, that's how life is seen. It's how human nature is seen. Um, whereas in the more equal countries, there's a greater awareness of the common good. And of course, dealing with global warming depends on being aware of the common good and acting on it like no other issue that human beings have ever faced. So consumerism and uh, um, um, public spiritedness. Um, I'm not quite sure why I put this graph in here, but um, uh, uh, we've just added a chapter to our book, and uh, um, the criticisms that we've had from right-wing organizations there's a book about, uh, called Merchants of Doubt, which is talking about how the same individuals and the same organizations have tried to undermine the evidence on um, um, climate change uh, and on um, acid rain and the stuff about ozone layers and about um, the evidence on smoking and tobacco and so on. The same people. And the motivation, they suggest, is um, uh, a sort of free market fundamentalism that uh, these right-wing groups are trying to uh, defend. Uh, and so in the uh, chapter we've just added, we've put in this because actually uh, the fact that the, the crash in 1929 and 2008 were both peaks of indebtedness and peaks of inequality um, shows, I think, that that it's misguided to think that uh, uh, attacking uh, stuff on the need for greater equality uh, is a defense of um, the market or democracy. Uh, both the market and democracy need greater equality. Uh, this comes from Paul Krugman. Um, it's rather outside my field, but you know, this is what's been happening to inequality in our society since 1979. Um, huge rise under Thatcher, a failure to undo it um, by successive governments. I always think I should add that Gordon Brown's budgets were redistributionary, um, but the little bit of good he did do was offset by the runaway top income, so the bonus culture and so on. Uh, so uh, completely failed to undo that uh, huge rise in inequality here. and. 
I think that we've been experiencing the long-term effects of that in the sort of increasingly antisocial nature of our society um, that I think everyone uh, feels. Um, so I'll stop there. But I think the take-home message, if you like, is, as I said at the beginning, that we need to stop thinking about improving the, the quality of our lives by raising material standards. And that's an individual strategy. If you make yourself, if you move up to social hierarchy, you, your well-being is, is improved. But for the whole society to get richer is a zero-sum game. Uh, the way we now improve the quality of our, our lives is by improving the quality of the social environment. And the exciting thing, I think, that comes out of this is that it implies that you know, unlike the sort of suggestion in uh, Richard Layard that uh, his book on happiness that we all need to go and have cognitive behavioral therapy uh, as the solution, I think this suggests that there is a, a policy lever on the psychosocial well-being of whole societies, reduce the ink of differences between us, um, and uh, you can make really major improvements. Uh, I haven't dealt much with causality. There's a chapter on each of these problems, um, taking you through the data for the American states and internationally and suggesting the causal pathways, but can't say it all. Okay. Thank you.